Welcome everyone to this session, the title of which is From Peace and Security to Human Development, Exploring the Nexus. I will introduce the, the panelists in, in, in a few minutes, but let me just perhaps share with you some introductory remarks to motivate the session. Um, a very good friend of mine, uh, Richard Cooper, who sadly passed away um, last December, um, he was a very noted international economist at, uh, at the Department of Economics at Harvard University, once pointed out to me that the UN Charter in the preamble, there is actually a statement to the fact that we must employ international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all peoples. And Richard said that as far as he was aware, this was perhaps the first time that the international community had taken on the responsibility for the promotion of economic and, and social development. And uh, the thinking at that time when the charter was adopted was that with the coming to an end of World War II, we would have something like a peace dividend. In other words, having spent the, the, the last several years um, uh, spending huge amounts of, of money and building up a, a huge amount of public debt to finance the war effort to defeat the, the Axis powers. Um, now we would enter a period in which we would have resources that could be allocated for economic and social and human development. A little bit like the peace dividend that was so much discussed at the end of the Cold War in the late 80s and early 1990s. Unfortunately, um, perhaps this peace dividend never really materialized. Uh, soon after the UN Charter was adopted, we had um, the Cold War and uh, you know, the massive defense buildup of the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, and, and, and so on, um, including, of course, the development of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. There was some progress in economic development. After all, the global economy during the many decades after the adoption of the UN Charter grew by something like 2% per year. And there was obviously you know, very important progress in expanding average life expectancy, reducing infant mortality, um, improving literacy. But I like to say that the progress was not as sustained and as comprehensive as could have been the case if in fact, you know, we had um, not had a Cold War and we had not had the kind of military buildup that, that took place during that, during that period. And so we find ourselves today in 2021 with, um, um, according to the data from the World Bank, uh, well over 800 million people uh, below the extreme poverty line, with 820 million people who suffer from malnutrition, and with equally large numbers, uh, well over 700 million people all, who are still illiterate, meaning they don't have access you know, to the most important tools for growing out of poverty. So it's a very mixed picture. And on top of that, of course, along the way, as we will discuss soon, we have inherited um, a whole range of other global problems which are, th are a threat to our future. I'm thinking of climate change in particular, but it's not the only one. We have you know, rising militarism, we have increasing malignant uses of technology for nefarious ends you know, across the planet and, and on and on. So, um, you know, in thinking about, about this landscape, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of something that was, uh, was said, I think very perceptively by uh, the head of the Baha'i community, Shoghi Effendi, who in the 1930s uh, wrote and said that the fundamental cause of world unrest is our failure to adjust our system of economic and political institutions to the imperative needs of a rapidly evolving age. A statement which seems to me to be very apt today as well. You know, we we uh, have all these problems and yet uh, we have a global governance architecture that is outdated. 
and that is not delivering the kinds of solutions that we, we need to address problems like climate change, poverty, inequality, um, you know, the development of uh, uh, all kinds of new weapon systems, which are all of them collectively a threat for our future. So, and of course, in, on top of these things, you know, we have the question, which we also hope to address in this panel, you know, how can we reform our institutional, our educational systems to support the required transformations in thinking and values that must support you know, these innovations in the area of global governance. So to discuss these issues, we have a, a very um, um, distinguished panel today. Um, we have Arthur Dahl, who is president of the International Environmental Forum and a former senior official of UNEP, UN Environment, with uh, many decades of experience in sustainability, international environmental assessment and governance. He is with us uh, from Geneva. Maya Groff uh, in The Hague is an international lawyer based there who has assisted in the development and servicing of multilateral treaties, working at various international criminal tribunals and teaching regularly at The Hague Academy of International Law. Uh, Joshua Lincoln, whose picture I see, is a senior fellow at the Graduate School of Global Affairs at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Between 2000 and 2013, he worked on global peace and security issues at the UN, including as uh, chief of staff to the director general of the UN office um, at Geneva. And I understand he's joining us from Boston. And then um, I hope that Darnell Rodriguez is with us. I don't see his photo, but maybe he's a little bit delayed. He's former executive director, global partnership for the prevention of our conflict and associate professor at the Instituto de Empresa University in Spain. And if he's with us, he's joining us from Madrid, as I understand. So um, we are going to um, uh, start with Arthur. Um, and uh, Arthur, my question to you is essentially the following. Um, you have heard this reference to the preamble in the UN Charter, uh, you know, to economic and social development as being a kind of a newly acquired responsibility of the international community. However, the UN Charter, as you well know, doesn't, doesn't make any reference to climate change. Um, although I think scientists were aware already back then that, that there was a process of, of global warming, um, it didn't come into the radar screen until many, many years later. Now, you in your, in your sort of capacity as a scientist have been involved in many of the debates which have taken place in, over the last several decades. You were in Stockholm in 1972, you were in Rio in 1992, and in other uh, sort of discussions that have taken place under the framework of the U United Nations around issues of environment. Please share with us a little bit of this sense of history, you know, how our thinking has evolved on environmental issues. And, and uh, the kinds of threats uh, to the environment which are emanating from the particular economic system that, that we, we, we have. Um, in some of the writings that I have seen that you have put out in recent uh, months and years, you, know, you, you seem to, to, to uh, think or emphasize the urgency of the moment. Uh, what in your view is the best roadmap to forestall some of these more dire scenarios about the impact of climate change. You know, I myself, as a development economist, I'm especially concerned about the future evolution of poverty and inequality. Um, in a recent podcast uh, with a senior uh, World Bank official, um, she indicated that she thought that perhaps uh, the first, the SDG number one on, on the elimination of extreme poverty was probably out of reach. As you know, this particular goal is really the foundation of, of, of the whole, the whole uh, framework. So, um, Arthur, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, you know, when I was a student uh, in the early 1960s, we were just becoming aware of environmental problems as a result of our economy. We discovered that pesticides might be killing birds, uh, uh, that uh, there, there was the first oil spills in a major sense. And suddenly, environment sort of crept onto the agenda. So by the time we got to 1972, and you know the 
the Stockholm conference, which I attended representing the Baha'i community, uh, we really saw the need already for a multilateral approach. These are problems beyond what any one country could deal with. And of course that led to the founding of UNEP, creation of things like the regional seas program of governments working together around a sea area. And again, the whole UN system to take on environmental issues. So that was the time when gradually this became a major part of the, of the UN's concern. By the time I reached the Rio Earth Summit uh, in 1992, where I helped to draft Agenda 21, uh, this became sustainable development. It went beyond just environmental issues. But at the same time, environment was somehow marginalized or fragmented. UNEP was not given responsibility for sustainable development. It went to the Commission on Sustainable Development. In fact, some people believe that the, there was an intent to fragment the environment so it wouldn't interfere with the economy and economic development and, and, and business at the, at the global level. So we have many different environmental conventions and so in different parts of the world and so on, which makes it more difficult to function in a, in a co co coherent fashion. We have, in a sense, too many silos. There's been a lot of pro progress since then in terms of scientific advisory processes, the environmental conventions on climate change and biodiversity, notification. We couldn't get one on forests because it was too close to economic interests who wanted to log the forests and so on and didn't want the international convention to get in their way. We of course had a whole series of events since then, since then the World Sustainable Development in 2002 in Johannesburg, Rio Plus 20 in 2012, with the 2030 Agenda Sustainable Development Goals adopted, the Paris Agreement in 2015. There were lots of important steps forward, but they haven't really touched the economic system, which has kept environment and social as kind of externalities. Just looking at worldwide economic exploitation for profit, but the consumer society, the materialistic goals, and a kind of a neo-colonial exploitation of the developing world. We, we know that more wealth is extracted from developing countries than is returned to them in aid programs by the way the system is constructed. So uh, we, have a, we have a system that's designed to create more wealth for the wealthy. The banking system and the stock market and so on is concentrating wealth more and more at the top. Uh, but it's all looking at GDP as the measure of progress. GDP says nothing about well-being. Anything good or bad contributes to GDP, auto accidents and increased health care and so on. All of this is good for GDP, so it's the wrong measure. Look, anything to do with social you know, well-being or, or environmental responsibility. Of course, all of this has led to what you see what might call a, a failure of implementation. We've got lots of wonderful agreements, everything from the, the UN Charter to Agenda 21 to the Paris Agreement and all these other things. Governments like to sign up to high ideals but they fail on implementation. Already, uh, we have a problem with negotiation because we have the consensus rule, where it's always the lowest common denominator that all countries can agree to. Any one country can, in its own self-interest, block an agreement until they get their way in the process. We get a lot of, of all sorts of bad things hiding behind national sovereignty and autocratic regimes and human rights you know, thing, problems and so on and so forth, all protected by the concept of national sovereignty. And we have this growing corporate power where the corporations are bigger and more powerful than most governments of the world. Just one example of where the economic system has taken us astray is the oil companies and climate change. We know that the oil companies knew in the 1960s that their, their fossil fuels would create global warming and have serious impacts in the future. They have their own internal studies that said so. And yet they continued to hide this, they continue you know, company deceit, lobbying, disinformation up until the present time to protect their short-term economic interests. So this has been, you might say, we've had a lot of good progress in this area, but it has not yet turned the corner with respect to the economic system still driven by the wrong kind of drivers and ignoring human well-being or our sustainable environmental future. Looking then, you might say, at the, at the road ahead, looking more, mostly, say, climate change and issues of poverty, as you mentioned, Almost all the complex system studies and modeling suggest that some kind of collapse is inevitable. Nobody's found a way to find the different systems to converge on something sustainable without something breaking along the way. We've gone too far in exploiting the resources of the planet and so on. So we have the overuse of planetary resources uh, going beyond planetary boundaries, you know, the rise in costs as the, as the damage increases and as resources become more limited, it's harder to find replacement resources. 
We've got limits in terms of food production, water, and, and energy supplies. We've got an economy that's really on life support by endless borrowing by central banks to you know, prevent the economy you know, from collapsing. And therefore this massive bubble of debt that can never be resolved, this sort of being rolled over again and again, but nobody seems to acknowledge that we'll never be able to repay that enormous borrowing in, in governments, in the corporate sector, you know, in consumer debt and so on. So, and we have climate change accelerating with its rising costs, growing inequality with extreme wealth and persistent or increasing poverty you know, with, the, with the pandemic. Uh, we have, we're, we're seeing with pandemics, that's really a, the failure of multilateralism. You know, it all went back to nations guarding the, the, the vaccines for their people first, whether they recognize that everybody on the planet must be vaccinated to keep the virus from, 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 from changing and getting around you know, our controls. So how do we make a transition like with the, the energy, fossil fuel energy fueled economy, which will create many losers. Imagine all the countries that depend on fossil fuels for the major source of income, all the people employed in everything to do with fossil fuels and on a gasoline powered automobiles and all these things. There's an enormous transition required to find new things for them to do. And yet we keep avoiding the change, the vested interests are blocking the change and will make it that much more difficult to make a transition that could have been more gradual and more sensitive to all of the, the losers as well as the winners. So if we look, for instance, at the issue of global environmental governance, I want to go on too long, uh, but clearly we need to, if we want to address these issues at the global level, which is where the only way we can, we have to have some process for global legislation to be able to make laws to protect us from those planetary boundaries, to keep us within the limits of what the planet can support. Uh, and therefore, we need to have some process for then enforcing legislation, uh, so it's not simply voluntary as at present time. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have to take some principles of governance to the global level in those areas where it cannot be done in any other way. One thing that may help us, and just to be talking recently with others, we need a kind of a global accounting system that goes beyond the financial system and takes the principles of accounting in terms of capital and debt and interest on debt and repayment of capital and so on, but saying, can we do this with other kinds of capital that are more relevant, but it's really important on the planet? If we start with climate change, think of accounts in terms of carbon. You know, carbon capital is carbon that's in the soil, in the ground, in the biodiversity on the planet. You know, carbon debt is when the carbon is in the atmosphere and creating global warming. And therefore, anything that is extracting carbon capital and turning it into carbon debt ought to be taxed. So the extraction of fossil fuels is extracting carbon from the atmosphere. In fact, historical carbon the countries in the atmosphere ought to be taxed as well. We charge interest on loans. And therefore, past contributions to the atmosphere should be taxed in the same way. And funds could then go to complete the circle by paying to preserve existing forests, to restore other areas of carbon capture and storage and so on, and to complete the circle. It's not simply the carbon costs of release, but also the carbon benefits to putting carbon back where it belongs in the soil. Because the same kind of accounting could be done you know, for biodiversity, could be done you know, for different levels of pollution and how do we correct for pollution in the world. We need to have social accounting that could look at such things as the food cycle, make sure everybody's properly fed in the world, health accounting, make sure everybody ultimately is healthy, uh, we need, the, at the economic level, some kind of accounting for dealing with poverty and making sure that everybody has some kind of a guaranteed minimum income. Everybody has enough to feed themselves, to house themselves, uh, to provide fundamental well-being as part of being the human being on this planet. We need to have accounting for work, not just employment, but every kind of service people can give to society should be part of that capital of our ability to create wealth at the planetary level. And we should account for that and not simply think of it in terms of the monetary side, but in terms of what this really means in terms of, of human well-being and human unity for every human being. We need accounts for knowledge and science and, and culture, which have to be transmitted to education. You know, this is a whole forum on education. So how do we make certain we design systems that can give us the right indicators to go forward and transmit that all of that wealth that we have from generation to generation, rather than simply privatizing it as we do too often in the present economic system. And then finally, to conclude, we need some kind of spiritual capital and ethical values. I mean, how well are we building the fundamental values that design the better future society 
into the ways in which we're measuring our progress and saying, we're moving forward, we're achieving our vision, what would be a better world? So that's a very brief view, I think, of where we can go in terms of the environmental side of things, what we've learned and what we can be taking as we go forward and giving to our academic institutions and educational process a whole new vision of where they should be going and prepare young people for this future that is coming. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Arthur, for that very comprehensive response to, to my question. Um, if we have a little bit of time, I'd like to come back to some of the issues that you have raised on, on the issue of accounting. Um, uh, Joshua, um, I guess one of the lessons that comes out of COVID-19 over the last year and a half is that we perhaps need to rethink a little bit our, our concepts of national security. It seems to me that in, in recent decades, national security has been framed uh, or understood um, mainly in terms of military preparedness and our ability you know, to defend our national borders against, uh, against either real or imaginary uh, um, adversaries. But uh, there are people who think, I'm thinking for instance of Jody Williams, the 1997 Nobel laureate, uh, for the campaign to ban landmines, who have been very forcefully making the case that national security should be reframed and thought of more in terms of human welfare. So we would say that we have national security if we are ready to tackle the next pandemic. We have national security if we have public health infrastructures that are going to be able to provide services to the people in the middle of a crisis, or uh, you know, we have resources to feed our people so that they are not malnourished and, and pose a, uh, a threat to, 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 to themselves, to the global economy. Um, and, and, and then, of course, you know, we have uh, national security. We have the resources to educate our, our children, to give them the skills that are necessary, you know, to, to um, um, gain uh, employment and so on. Having spent many years working within the UN system, how do you see the prospects for implementing the kinds of reforms that will gradually turn the United Nations into a problem solving organization that actually delivers on the, on the promises of, of the UN Charter? And share with us your thoughts on how we could better harness the powers of a peaceful cooperation in the search for you know, meaningful solutions to some of our most uh, serious global problems, which at the moment the system obviously is not delivering. Thank you, Augusto, uh, for that very large question uh, to get us get us going. Um, and I would just to say thank you for the opportunity to to be on this panel here. And I'm I'm keenly aware that the 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 conference is focused on the issue of education. So in thinking through our, our topic or peace and security, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to frame it in, in terms that relate to the, the wider agenda of, of education and higher education. Um, I, would, I would then use my couple of minutes, I think, to briefly touch on some of the points you mentioned, human security, um, the, the current state of play, if you will, in the, in the UN system, and then perhaps to, to pull back out and ask a couple of questions about the, what I would call the, how, to, how to reach a new level of effectiveness and success in the, in the, in the multilateralism of the future, um, in the, the direction where we're headed. So just to, to, to begin, I would begin with an observation, which is um, usually thought and especially conversation in the area of global governance and even more so in international peace and security um, descends very quickly into opinionated arguments that, that, that use um, certain labels um, that are then embraced and cherished and um, advanced and brandished and sometimes hurled back and forth. And, um, those lab labels include liberal versus conservative and realist versus idealist and internationalist versus isolationist. And as one progresses, the ist grows and becomes sharper. And uh, for me, the fundamental question for a conference on education and for the question of education is actually, is, is this helpful? Because education systems have tended to defend, uh, explore, um, protect and shrine, crystallize some of these dichotomies, some of these labels, which I, I think, uh, particularly listening to Arthur, just, who just finished his remarks, no longer really help us in thinking through the, the world as we, as we see it and experience it. So much of the challenge seems to me to be to move beyond these labels uh, 
beyond these sort of comfortable um, corners that we have sort of ensconced ourselves in and to venture out into the middle of the room. The concept of, of human security is now about 25 years old, a little bit older. It's generally related to 1994. Um, and it, it, in very simple terms, it advances the notion that security is best conceived of as the security of people rather than the security of states. Um, there's been a, a literature around it. There's a history to the concept. Um, and, but you see it uh, picking up steam. Uh, 25 years, 27 years is a very short time in the history of the world. Um, and yet we've already had a full generation's worth of thought and exchange on it. And one, one can see in the documents and the debates in all the work, um, the intergovernmental work itself, the track one work, but also the academic work, the research work, the civil society work that only 27 years later, this is a this is a fundamental reorientation of the concept of security. Um, I think from there, I would I would go and just make a couple of comments about the current state of play. In 70, last year, a year ago, we had the 75th anniversary of the UN, and um, it was a very lackluster and somewhat depressing anniversary and birthday as these things go. Um, it was the middle, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, everyone stayed home. There were some lovely Zoom interactions, but that was about it. And it, it prompted a renewed sense of um, urgency and concern around the, the current strength of multilateralism as a whole in the UN system in specifically. A, a, a political declaration which was issued by member states that was sort of as, as much as the traffic could bear in September 2020. And, uh, and the, the ball was kicked by the member states back over to the secretary general and they essentially asked him to produce a report within a year with proposals to take forward a, a revitalization agenda. And so this past September now, two, three months ago, the secretary general came back at the 76th General Assembly and presented a report called uh, Our Common Agenda. And in, in, in very, if one had to summarize it, I think uh, I would say it was, it was big, it was bullish um, and, uh, and uh, it was ambitious, uh, perhaps more so than anticipated given the very lackluster and somewhat depressed state of, of, of international cooperation um, made all the more obvious by what are, what are fundamental failures to respond to um, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Very briefly, um, that that uh, common agenda basically said said that we are in an inflection point in history that our choice is to sort of break down or break through that um, it must begin with a, a reconceptualization of solidarity and trust at the international level a and a fairly aggressive um, um, move or proposal to 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 make the global commons and global common goods the centerpiece of a renewed multilateralism and a renewed UN system. It identified seven different areas uh, as global common goods and then advanced a set of proposals in each of those areas. So uh, not surprisingly, peace and security was one of those areas. And um, in, in sort of more specific terms, it proposed to reduce strategic risks, i.e. nuclear weapons, cyber warfare, autonomous weapons. It proposed to strengthen the international capacity for foresight, uh, which is a, a very interesting subject maybe for, for, for us to discuss, because a lot of the foresight today that doesn't come from deep inside government agencies comes from open forum like these. It proposed to reshape responses to all forms of violence, to invest in prevention and peace building, including the peace building fund and peace building commission. It proposed to support um, an accelerated emphasis or greater emphasis on regional prevention and peace and security. None of these are new, um, but they all sort of uh, offered a, a, a set of uh, lines of action or lines of work in the area of peace and security. Uh, finally, it offered to put women and girls at the center of security policy and um, to focus in particular on the sustainable, peaceful and secure use of outer space, including through a multi-stakeholder dialogue on, on, on outer space. Um, these were, uh, to that end, the, the Secretary General proposed to create a, an advisory panel and uh, that would surely include a lot of contribution from civil society, one form or another, and identified a, a, a benchmark on the calendar two years out in September 2023, 
um, uh, for a summit of the future. So in, 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 in an interesting way, coming out of the pandemic and with a, with a one year delay, we, we now have a, a very intense, very um, calendar ahead of us in a very open period of discourse, dialogue, um, debate around the, the broad direction in which the, the world must move. Um, so th that is the sort of the, the current the current uh, perspective on it. I would I would finish with one one item um, that the world is moving towards a, multi, a more pluralistic um, um, structure is is uh, beyond debate. Uh, multipolarity, multiple levels of of, of uh, governance, multiplicity of actors. All of these are the elements that come in. From an educational perspective, I think there are there are three capacities or three principles that would be would be interesting to think through for 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 the role or the place which they find in education. Um, the, the the first of these three capacities that we when we look ahead that is going to be crucial is the capacity to act early and decisively to find partners and fora for action. And this is part of moving away from, a, the, shall we call it a, a system that privileged on the one hand, uh, hegemonic go it alone behavior and on the other hand by a very few and on the other hand, free riding behavior by very many. Um, so th this is true as well for the governmental world as for the non-governmental world. Uh, many of our, um, uh, many of uh, the aspects of modern day business, in fact, are ahead of this on this. And it relates to the second one, which is greater agility within uh, internally um, institutions, governments, businesses, corporations, nonprofit organizations, the ability to embrace greater ad hocracy and to remain mission focused in, and to retain agility and the ability to focus, coalesce around problems and then do it again. Um, startups are very good at this business um, and uh, governments are very bad at it by and large, but it has a requirement in terms of education that we have to, that we have to think about how, how to promote that forward. And I think the last one would be that um, we have to rebalance the, uh, the relationship in, in global governance between effectiveness and trust. This is an enormous trend this century. If you think about the end of World War I, a century ago, global decisions were being made by dozens, not hundreds or thousands, usually dozens, generally white men behind closed doors. And if you contrast that to um, COP26, which we just saw, or the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement on, on Climate, which I think reportedly had 45,000 attendants, including 10,000 official delegates, you get a sense of the, 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 the rebalancing that is required be between inclusion and expertise. And um, those inclusion is a, is a big subject, but it is one that has to be addressed far more systematically going forward, in particular, the perspectives of, of women um, and, and of those groups and population of youth um, and of those groups and population that have been underrepresented, underrepresented or that have not had a, a significant voice or place at the table. So I would just leave it there a lot to come back to um, when we get to the next stage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for that very comprehensive overview. Um, Maya, um, let me come to you now. Um, the sort of foundation for a renewed United Nations, um, which has been very much part of the discussions over the last year since the, the UN 75 commemorations, obviously has to be sort of share values uh, of all those who support it and a kind of a solid civics understanding of global institutions. Um, it seems to me that populations around the world ha have to be grounded in key principles of the international order. Um, you yourself have written on you know, peaceful settlement of disputes and universal respect for human rights as being at the center of this you know, to uphold these principles and, and the relevant institutions. Um, education, I guess, is also needed for those who serve the strength of global institutions and those who participate in international governance processes. We will need to develop new skills, new ways of thinking, and, and particular, you know, qualities will have to evolve. 
um, that have a, a bearing on, on leadership and, and the international environment. Can you elaborate for us a little bit on the forms of education and the sharing of knowledge that should accompany the proposed processes of UN reform uh, to ensure the, the emergence of functional global governance um, that will require, no doubt, um, very large amounts of, of international cooperation. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Augusto, uh, for these, these questions and lovely to be here. And I think these questions, as, as you've posed them, are very important. And, and also I applaud the organizers of this conference for featuring education, education for the 21st century. This is, this is vital even for our times. As, as Josh was noting, the, the UN Secretary General uh, stating explicitly, you know, we're at this inflection point in history with intersecting global challenges and unprecedented global risk. As Arthur was saying, these ecological crises we face are truly unprecedented um, in our history as a, as a human species. So um, education is important for so many reasons in terms of our global architecture, global governance, not least uh, what Josh was saying also about these unhelpful dichotomies that have dominated, especially in some spheres, you know, realist versus idealist, et cetera. How, how do we overcome you know, these old ways of thinking to really think about how we move to the next uh, phases uh, of our shared global governance. So uh, part of the reason I, I personally started to work on more macro global governance reform issues, such as uh, those uh, we cover in our 2020 book that Augusto Arthur and I wrote, which is available for free open access on Cambridge University Press website. And we propose really to upgrade the UN architecture quite boldly to make it fit for purpose to, to really tackle difficult 21st century challenges. And, but I, I came to this work about, we really need to think big in terms of our global architecture reform because of my firsthand uh, experiences of the educational gaps that, that really exist, uh, such as those that, that you note uh, in your question, uh, Augusto. Uh, so, for example, in my, my approximately 15 years of work in the development and servicing of multilateral binding international treaties, also at, you know, some various uh, international criminal tribunals in The Hague, I was, I was struck by what seemed to be uh, a paradoxical kind of reality. First, in my practical experience of, of working on treaty negotiation, servicing these, these intense, uh, in terms of the international cooperation requirements, treaties, there was an abundance of will, capacity, enthusiasm, persistence of officials from diverse states around the world, every region, to work together on these, these international projects, some very challenging international projects and instruments, and also, of course, a pressing need for, for greater international collaboration, put aside all of these risks that we're facing just in terms of globalization, the movement of people, uh, economic globalization, there's a greater need for, for, for very close international collaboration and coordination. Uh, so the dichotomy was, despite this enthusiasm that I saw in, in practice, um, there, is a, there was a lack of grounding, general grounding in many of the international officials uh, in, in the history and the key goals, the key systems, uh, such as those set up in the Charter for peaceful dispute settlement and collective security, really what are the foundational aims of the international uh, uh, system that we have now, and also this vision of progressive development of, of this system and indeed of the Charter, which was supposed to be reviewed within 10 years of 1945. So I do think that there is a fundamental need for those working within various international organizations, and it's often overlooked to, to understand the history of, of, of the current UN Charter, precursor institutions and processes. Uh, and from my perspective, this, this lack of deeper understanding has been part of the reason why the UN Charter has remained largely frozen in time for 75 years. Also, uh, there's really a need to consolidate and reinforce various methods to, to ensure international public officials, be they serving within international organizations or representing states, uh, 
uh, have this very developed international civics understanding because this is generally an education that uh, um, they're not receiving at home. Domestic education is still very nationally focused, if not nationalistically focused, which, which is a huge challenge. So we can all make a contribution uh, in that way at, at institutions of higher education, wherever we are throughout our, our, our national educational systems to make sure there's this sort of global civics uh, grounding. And uh, there's, there's a lot of work to do also to enhance uh, the sort of ethical foundation, uh, the service orientations of all international civil servants to make sure they're very firmly devoted to uh, collective, the collective well-being of the international community, which is a whole other subtopic <laughs> because it's, it can be actually quite complex in terms of ethical codes of international civil servants and different rules that they are subject to. But just to say, for example, one proposal we make in the book in terms of this, this, this new uh, levels of education needed, we propose an international judicial training institute for judges, international judges that will serve at international courts and tribunals, because this simply does not exist at present. Uh, so uh, judges, again, they receive only their national grounding, whereas now international law is, is so sophisticated and multifaceted and, and very intense in terms of its demands. Uh, so there's many other aspects of that uh, to form our international civil servants, uh, judges, uh, et cetera. So on the public education side uh, that you mentioned, uh, very interestingly, uh, there are very regular articulations of obligations of national governments in many different international treaties, declarations, for example, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Convention on the right of, Rights of the Child, the SDGs, uh, for example, to name a few, where nations are obligated to educate their, their, their national publics on human rights, on international values, for example, SDG 4 and Target 4.7 talks about all learners should be educated on human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, appreciation of cultural diversity. <laughs> so you see, there's, there's this amazing vision also in current international law about the need for the education of publics uh, in international values, civics, but this really hasn't been carried through. So we need new uh, efforts. And the younger generations, I think, are, are, are more and more connected, but there is this, this gap in, in, in serious efforts to promote understanding of, of, of key norms and also key institutions like the International Court of Justice, UN Security Council, uh, UN uh, General Assembly, and their, their weaknesses, uh, how they could be improved. Uh, again, this is just a huge gap that the international community it has slipped through the cracks despite these obligations. And lastly, just on the point of the use of mass media, uh, this is absolutely crucial and vital, and but we have the capacity to, to really discuss global governance and what we need to really manage 21st century challenges. But unfortunately, we are confronting an infodemic around the world uh, with various uh, sources and dimensions to that, uh, often with international and regional institutions being distorted and misrepresented as part of this infodemic, I would say. Um, so, but there is a huge potential here also, and, and we have some partners who are, who are working to try to, to build awareness through the mass media in this area. And uh, I was even contacted, for example, recently in relation to our book by a social media influencer with about 5 million followers who wants to talk about global governance with a broader audience. So just on a very positive note, there seems to be a demand for, for discussion and, and more knowledge, more high quality knowledge on global institutions. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Maya. Thank you very much. I, I find your statement about the importance of um, uh, encouraging a sense of global citizenship through our educational system, you know, very, very interesting and, and perceptive. It seems to me that there is a bit of a gap between the insights that come from science, especially from genetics, which have established, you know, sort of our common humanity. The fact that the genetic makeup, makeup of all different racial groups is actually virtually identical on the one hand. And um, the, the persistence of, of, you know, barriers between, between nations, between ethnic groups, between genders, you know, which sort of sits uncomfortably with, 
where the insights that come from science. And for me, this, is, this suggests that there is a huge role for education and helping us bridge that gap. So that ultimately, you know, we all come uh, out of this process with a sense of you know, being citizens of the, of the, of the, same, the same motherland, so to speak. Um, Darnell, um, let me come to you. Um, the dysfunctionality of the Security Council um, you know, has been evident already for many, many years. And it has, as we have seen, manifested itself in the huge number of crises we have seen, human rights abuses in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Darfur, in Myanmar, in Yemen, in Syria, and in many other, other places. Um, and this has led, it seems to me, to an increasing focus on the role of civil society and in its, in, 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 in its participation in initiatives of international cooperation. At the same time, there is a, a talk of, in academia of the need to expand the concept of multilateralism that envisages greater citizen participation so that they will feel more connected in, uh, you know, to multilateral organizations and perhaps you know, uh, enhance their accountability in some, in some fashion. What are some of the options open to accelerate this, this power shift, which I think on the whole is very, very good, it's very favorable. And what is the role of education in catalyzing these processes of change? Thanks, Augusto. Thanks for uh, the invitation to participate in this event. Um, indeed, uh, as Maya was saying, uh, I think we need to move towards a type of uh, global governance, new global governance arrangement that enable us to really tackle some issues which are truly global, some threats which are truly global. At the moment, how do we do that? Uh, we do that through international institutions. No? The, the, the truth is that today global governance and in the foreseen future is articulated through the international institutions we have, multilateral institutions. Whether those are global institutions such as the UN or regional multilateral institutions such as the Organization of American States, the African Union, the League of Arab States, etc. So there is a big role for multilateral institutions in this big global governance uh, arrangement, of course. What is the problem? The problem is that I feel, like you mentioned, there is a big gap between what these international institutions and the citizens that they are uh, intended or supposed to, to represent. That's because the, the institutional system, the inter international institutional system we have right now was not set up to serve the people as their main client, but the states are their main client. I think it was uh, Joshua was mentioning that we need to somehow make that transition from organizations working on a, a purely national security logic to organizations actually moving to towards a human security uh, uh, logic. Problem is how do we do that? You know? How do we do that transformation of, of uh, be, being you know, um, organizations whose main uh, or whose sole, almost sole customer are the states, member states, and how do we uh, make a shift so that they, they're also responsive uh, to the citizens of those states. No? And sometimes we find the paradox that actually those who have the seat and the representation, in those organizations are in some cases actually the ones threatening the very security of the citizens of the state that, that they represent it to some, to some extent. So um, we need to see how we can close this gap. And, and we need to see, and to close this gap, we need to really show what the added value of the multilateral system is. And it has to be explicitly shown that the UN has an added value, the regional forums has an added value, but not only shown in a theoretical place, and it, people need to feel what that added value of multilateral organizations are and how their needs, uh, their uh, concerns, can also be represented at these forums. So that's when you talk about transforming these forums from uh, forums of states into more like public agoras where, people, where we have different interests that can be aggregated and different type of actors that can express those interests and can see the usefulness of those organizations. If we don't manage to make that transitions, I'm afraid that gap is going to continue to be there and there is going to be uh, increasing indifference not even hostility, but simply indifference towards uh, international organizations, which uh, should be the ones articulating our global governance arrangements. In that sense, I agree with Maya that there is a role for education in, in, in just simply promoting the idea of global citizenship and global participation, global ownership of these organizations. I think that's an important message 
to uh, incorporate in all the different uh, educational systems and something that we should perhaps strive for. That's of course uh, easier said than done, no? because it's not easy to transform the mindset of these organizations who have been operating and who are created under a different logic than, than the one that is needed right now. And I think we need to uh, start making small advances, small baby steps towards, towards that. Uh, really creating a better spaces for interaction, for continuous interaction of the people in these organizations. The ECOSOC system that we have, I'm sorry, but that's that's not enough. No, it's, it's almost uh, impossible. I mean, we, I, I worked in an organization and we took, I think, four or five years and then organized to get a credit, ECOSOC accreditation. And then that doesn't really give you much in terms of uh, you know, what you can do to, to really provide to feel that you're providing a meaningful input into the global policy making. We need to create more smaller, more targeted, more um, effective spaces where people can feel that they can provide their input on specific issues and specific policy discussions with relevant policy makers. We don't have to go to these super mega conferences and give great speeches, maybe smaller spaces for discussions, but where input can really be delivered and where we can have really deep discussions, deep conversations from different stakeholders on how a particular policy affects them and, 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 and where this, this co-creation space, maybe that's something that we could advance towards in the future. Uh, those can be informal spaces at first. No, we don't have to create a great uh, institutional space. There is a political will that is needed if we're going to move towards creating these spaces, whether informal or informal. And, and, and again, that's easier said than done because there's a lot of resistance to even creating this, this type of spaces for, for civil society organizations. It's like, okay, yeah, who chooses you? Who chooses what organizations are going to participate there? Why this and not this one? If there's gonna be a forum, maybe I can propose what organizations can go and represent that. And we find those kind of challenges as well. And maybe articulating this participation with existing structures on behalf of civil society, and I'm talking about large civil society networks, now, that could be a way forward of really saying, okay, maybe we could articulate that cooperation through these networks and they can help in identifying what relevant, credible, uh, more legitimate organizations can participate in X or Y discussion according to their expertise. And, and you know, that's something where, where uh, maybe civil society can play a role to do that. One final point to end, something my, my time uh, about the role of uh, education. Uh, uh, and the multilateral organizations. When we're talking about developing global citizenship and especially global arrangements and a global mindset, I think um, there is a big role for really interaction and exchange. You know, that's, that's the key. I mean, uh, so it, this is not something very difficult to understand theoretically. I think it's something that you have to experience this, this global citizen movement. And you have to create spaces for that experience to take place. You know, whether those are physical exchanges, kind of like you know, imagine a global Erasmus program, something like that would be great. Uh, but now we also have technological tools that enable us to maybe not so great as an Erasmus program, but maybe have continuous frequent interaction between different people. And, and let's use these uh, virtual spaces to, to promote those, those, those spaces, those discussions. And, and maybe an interesting, I'm thinking back and I'll close with this. I'm thinking back of a, of a project that we held at GPAC a couple of years ago uh, around teaching people, teaching young people how to make movies. It was called Cameras in Hand and we implemented it in Kyrgyzstan in the Fergana Valley where we were essentially uh, teaching young kids to make movies was an excuse to promote interaction between them and help them co-create a, a product. Uh, and, and, and create this uh, excuse, this space for, for interaction and challenging uh, stereotypes among each other, et cetera. Uh, the outcome of the project was, was interesting because we thought that they were going to be talking about the ethnic uh, differences in their, in their village and how that much is affecting them, but they ended up talking about some very more practical uh, issues. They ended up talking about street lighting and how that was affecting them, no? how, um, uh, child marriage was a big concern. No? They were talking about things that we never thought that they were going to be talking about. And we thought, okay, this is not only a great tool for, for, for peace building, challenging uh, perceptions among different groups, but actually for articulating human security perspectives, because this is, this, 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 they are telling us what they are really interested in. And what we thought they were going to make their movies, that didn't happen. They, they were telling us their true concerns, 
uh, regardless of the ethnic background where they came from or something they say no we are interested is about street lighting because that's what's what's happening we managed to bring creative projects like that use new technologies create spaces whether virtual or real to enable that that participation that communication from what really uh, concerns people in the ground i think uh, multilateral organizations and educational institutions have an opportunity to be creative and, and, and develop those kind of spaces that would enable us to develop this feeling of joint global citizenship, but also of ownership and representation of what really matters to me in global institutions. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Darinel, um, for a very interesting, interesting overview and, and for tapping into your very interesting sort of background and experience looking at these, these issues at the level of individuals and civil society organizations. Um, we have a few minutes left for, for some participation from the audience. And I see that in the chat, we have a question from uh, Jonathan Granoff. Uh, I don't know whether he's still with us, but he was uh, the moderator in the previous session to ours. And he asks uh, about any ideas that we may have on how to mainstream human security. Uh, he says strategy, uh, strategy, scale, uh, focus, top down, mass communication, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any, any volunteers um, from, from the panel? Um, yes, Josh. I'm, I'll, I'll give it a, an initial, uh, uh, initial attempt, but I'm hoping somebody else will join me. I, I saw the question and I was, I sort of said, uh, thinking to myself, a pandemic? a climate emergency, um, you know, <laughs> tongue in cheek, of course, but, but these are in effect the things that begin to move um, systems of, of thought and systems of action. Um, a, there is an extent to which, of course, human security is already mainstreamed into, into the, the, the global governance uh, framework. 27 years is, is the blink of an eye. It, one, one could well think, you know, we're living through a, a, a revolution or a very rapid evolution in terms of our frameworks. And the fact that, you know, uh, today a secretary general or the IMF's latest, uh, you know, publication this month or anybody, any, any number of instances take this as a given framework partially because of the nature of the crises that are upon us is, is a very, very fundamental uh, benchmark along the way. Um, I, would, I would add to that, I think that there is no single strategy. Uh, global events, global crises provide some of it. The rest of it is bottom up. Some of it will eventually become top down. Pressure is asserted from, from, the, from the sidelines or what used to be the sidelines, civil society, academia, research, the, the voices other than governments. Um, there are, I, I would say the mainstreaming is well underway. There are domains that remain sort of narrowly defended classic security domains. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of weapons of mass destruction and the architect, their architecture where really the, the discussions are still very, very traditional and very narrow. But these are also the areas in which, uh, in, which are in crisis, uh, in which progress has been, has been difficult or impossible. And they're under their own new pressures, the pressures of technology. Um, these days, open source intelligence means that, you know, you and I can see in our Twitter feed in the morning what used to be the exclusive prerogative of heads of state in their morning security briefs, satellite pictures of things happening halfway across the world. And that same technology has brought thousands and millions of new voices into play. And I think we are just uh, going to continue to see that trend grow. So that's my, my first response to it. Um Thank you, Josh. Arthur? I think, I think we're seeing in the environmental domain, this is greatly expanded people participating. You look at the Fridays for the Future, the, the youth marching in the streets. They very much see climate change threatening their human security, their whole future. And so I think we will find some of these, these new crises are also greatly expanding the, the sort of people involved in the debate. You say the same thing so with biodiversity and indigenous peoples. They're responsible for some 80% of remaining biodiversity in the areas they're still responsible for. And suddenly they're at the table, they're in the, in the, in the biodiversity convention, there is working groups on them, their voices are being heard more and more. So I think we're, we're, as these multiple issues come together and are locked with each other, uh, 
it's also expanding the number of people involved both in the de definition of human security and in being directly involved in the debates around them as we go forward. So I think that's, that's it's an, it's encouraging the people begin to see that it's not simply silos of issues that have no relation to each other. They're all part of a fundamental challenge our society is facing as we're going forward with respect to security for everybody on the planet. Um, Darnell, Maya, any any um, a comment just, from you? Yeah, maybe just a quick point because yeah, I I, I, I like this points from from Joshua and Arthur that you these crises are, <laughs> you know, forcing us to take human security seriously. But I also I love the the basic suggestion from the questioner that uh, how how do we really actively affect this norm shift? And we can I think there can be much more active campaigns and 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 mainstreaming. Uh, and there are a lot of levers to do that. I think that's an excellent, excellent idea also to take advantage of this moment. I, I, I am so much in agreement with that. And uh, and also like within the UN system, uh, within the multilateral system, only, even one state, one little state, one large state, one medium sized state can have a huge, huge impact <laughs> across all the multilateral institutions or agencies, UN agencies that it's involved with can build a coalition of like-minded states and to really push this issue if they if, if they wish. They can push it at the Security Council, for example. So sometimes uh, why things don't get more, more mainstreamed is just a, a lack of you know, ideas, vision, and collective action. So I think there's huge potential. And UN agencies have also had excellent campaigns on different issues. You know, UN Women, Violence Against Women, UN Secretary General's Office have, have, have done brilliant work purely on the communications outreach front. So I think I think we should think in those ways of much more actively, you know, shifting norms and, and trying to push the international community where where it should go. Thank you. Darnell, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, human security is such a rich and broad topic that it's very hard to make it operational in one sense. Now, that's one of the big challenges of, of, of the human security. So that's why I think you, know, you have to approach it as the same way that you eat an elephant, that's one bite at a time. Uh, and start by working perhaps, uh, in my case, I've been working on the peace and security field. How can you articulate human security with security actors with, uh, at, the, at the local level no, uh, to, to be very practical how can you incorporate first of all how can you mainstream the human security approach within security forces in the respective countries because that's the first step many there are there is uh, sometimes skepticism when you talk about this with uh, people from the military people from the police but maybe if we need to really start uh, quote unquote educating more security forces about the usefulness of the human security approach and uh, perhaps in the future, see if this can be incorporated, as it already is in some countries, in the, in the military doctrine of, of the different countries. You know, that when, when a, the police or a member of the military is being trained, you know, that this comes from the beginning in their educational curriculum, there is already some kind of orientation into human security and how they can articulate that in their future work. And then at the local level, okay, let's see how uh, part of, of human security is bringing this bottom-up perception, this bottom-up uh, um, uh, input from, from, from people in communities. Then again, what we need to do a very basic step is create opportunities for that input to be gathered and, 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 and for security forces and people from the communities that are uh, the recipients of those security uh, work that is being done to have frank conversations say, hey, this is, this is what really concerns us uh, in regards to our security. This is really the problem in my town, in my community. Uh, uh, and, and create those spaces Create awareness, really, among the different actors concerned of, of security, of what is that people expect. That sometimes is not what what you know, the top think that they should expect. They have, like it was in our case, in this small example that I gave you, something completely different and more, a lot more practical, and then it maybe can articulate uh, civil, military, police partnerships to address some of these political uh, uh, security concerns. You know, that so that that would be a way of mainstreaming i think the human security approach doing it on both ways yes on the civil society side but also on the security on the side of the security forces and try to articulate these partnerships for um, police civil military cooperation thank you thank you very much darinelle um we are running out of time let me just add an economist's perspective on on this very important question raised by by jonathan um 
one way to accelerate the shift away from uh, you know a, a concept of security that is very military based to human security is uh, believe it or not through a kind of a reorientation of the budget budget priorities you know once a year every government on the planet gets a chance to you know through the budget to do you know social economic uh, uh, policy and I think that one of the problems that we have had in recent decades is that you know our spending priorities are are misplaced. Uh, we're spending too much money subsidizing energy, uh, subsidizing uh, or uh, you know building up our military establishments. We're not spending enough on on health, on education, on you know sort of relevant infrastructures. Um, people, business community, civil society don't often take much interest in this process, but organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, uh, you know, have this constant dialogue with, with governments about what those priorities of, social, of spending should be. And I think that these organizations should be less reluctant to raise, you know, fundamental questions about, about human security and whether the resources and the budget are being spent to promote a vision of human security that is much more focused on human welfare rather than the military and other you know, unproductive expenditures. Well, I wish to thank all the panelists. Our time is up and I want to respect the fact that perhaps there is a session coming after our, our own. Uh, Arthur Dahl, Maya Groff, Joshua Lincoln, everybody. Thank you so much for your, for your contributions.